Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to chapter 7 of our course. And chapter 7 we are going to subdivide into two sections. Uh, in the first sections we are going to talk about convergent plate margins uh, with the subduction zone settings. In the second part we are going to talk about continent-continent collision. Here we see a series of sketches that illustrate intraoceanic convergence and here we see that oceanic lithosphere is subducted underneath other oceanic lithospheres, so two oceanic plates are in a convergent situation and one of them is getting subducted. There are three possible scenarios as kind of end members and uh, we see here in these two examples, in the migratory and in the stationary setting, we have subduction underneath an oceanic island arc. This oceanic island arc is formed by the magmatic activity triggered by a subduction of oceanic lithosphere. This is juvenile crust that uh, forms by the differentiation of the mantle magmas that uh, contribute to the growth of crust over here. These would be island arcs in an oceanic setting. A very similar situation we see here in the center, but here we are looking at a sliver of continental crust that is rifted off um, an, a cratonic uh, larger continental mass and is now separated from this continental mass by a back arc basin, by an oceanic back arc basin. So this would be a situation that we find in Japan or in uh, Cuba. Uh, the Aleutans are a good example for a stationary, uh, for a stationary island arc whereas uh, the Marianas and Tonga, Kremadek, uh, and Scotia arcs are uh, migratory arcs with uh, back arcs spreading behind them. Along continental margins, we are looking at uh, Andean type situations uh, like we see here on the left hand side where we have shallow subduction and contraction of the continental back arc in the uh, Sumatra Java situation and also the northwestern United States uh, in the recent geological past we, uh, there we see extension in the back arc and that is related to steep oceanic subduction. Here we see how subduction is initiated in uh, an early stage so when convergence starts between two plates and uh, here on the left hand side we see how it can be initiated along a initially passive continental margin, margin that grades into oceanic lithosphere. We know that the oceanic lithosphere is thinner, it has a higher density and uh, usually uh, is more stiff than the continental crust and lithosphere. And if such a situation comes into a convergent setting, we might find that the stiffer and thinner oceanic lithosphere is uh, subducted underneath the uh, more buoyant and less dense continental lithosphere which overrides the oceanic lithosphere. And that is where we would initiate then an oceanic trench and would start subduction uh, as soon as here a lithospheric scale thrust zone or reverse fault is, uh, is developed. In the intraoceanic uh, situation, we usually have a transform fault where we have a younger plate, uh, which is, uh, has a lower density, and an older part of a plate, because we know transform faults are plate margin. The older plate will be a little bit thicker. It will have a higher density. And uh, here we can have such a situation where a slightly thicker lithosphere borders to a slightly uh, thinner lithosphere, which also is uh, less competent and the more competent and more dense uh, older plate will start being subducted by converting the transform fault into a reverse fault as soon as convergence starts. Here we now see a later stage of uh, ongoing subduction of oceanic lithosphere underneath a continental margin and this continental margin here already experiences heat input, input from rising mantle generated magmas which come from somewhere deeper down here from a place in the asthenosphere on top of the downgoing oceanic lithosphere. Looking at the uh, four arc region we see uh, quite a number of important structural features we see here in the four arc 
A4 arc basin develop. We see here a small sliver of trapped oceanic crust, which is uh, still attached here to the uh, continental crust. And this oceanic lithosphere was sheared off a little bit offshore when the, uh, si when the subduction was initiated. Then we see here this accretionary prism, which consists of uh, slivers of uh, poorly consolidated uh, and usually relatively uh, soft material that never has been in very high uh, depth and very high grade metamorphism. But it is arranged in a series of such slivers which uh, are separated by thrust and reverse falls, which always show a top to the ocean sense of shear away from the continent. The tectonics in such accretionary prisms can be quite complex, and they are by far not as regular and simple as we see here in the sketch. Normally, we create here rocks that are called tectonic melanges because, uh, because the strain is very high, and we can juxtapose a material of very different provenance very close to, to other materials. So here we see the trench sediments, and uh, trench sediments are usually derived from somewhere here along in the four arc region and get deposited here in deep water environment. You know that the water depth in uh, oceanic trenches can exceed 10 kilometers. Further out here we see an area that is caused by bending of the lithosphere, which is an elastic flexing and uh, normal faulting in the outer swell will produce these horse and graben features that are related to the, in, uh, to the uh, flexing and also to the increasing bending of the oceanic lithosphere. In the outer curvature of such bends, we would have extensional strain. And this extensional strain creates, since we are in the brittle part of the oceanic lithosphere, it will create horse and graben features. The growing accretionary prism here supports the formation of the forearc basin. The forearc basin here in this region depends on the fact that we have here material piling up in such an accretionary prism. And the material that is used to build the prism is the uh, soft sediment that lies here on the uh, oceanic lithosphere. So this soft sediment has a low density. It has a low shear strength. Uh, it is very difficult to subduct such material into greater depth, and it will escape this subduction by uh, getting involved into these tectonic melanges, into these series of rivers and thrust falls that piles up this accretionary prism. The uh, topographic high of this accretionary prism that forms here by the piling up of these oceanic sediments in the prism that is the boundary of the forearc basin. Without an accretionary prism, we cannot form a forearc basin. And that means uh, in the situation where we might have very young oceanic crust, we will not find a significant amount of oceanic sediments deposited on this young oceanic crust. And so if we have such a situation, we will not form an accretionary prism, a wedge, uh, and or it will be a very small one, and therefore we cannot form this forearc basin. And also, in such a uh, situation, we might also find an empty trench, specifically if we have an arid climate on the continent that is not prone to transport a lot of material into the forearc region, either into the basin or into the trench. Here again, we see these horse graben tectonics that contribute to the segmentation of the upper oceanic uh, crust that is undergoing subduction. Here we see uh, highlighted the trench that has uh, contractional tectonics as opposed to the extensional tectonics that we see here. And uh, this segmentation, this formation of these topographic differences in the horse and the graben regions, that is an important factor that we want to investigate now here. Let's look at this segmented oceanic lithosphere with host and graven features uh, at the, in the brittle part of the downgoing slab. Uh, this is a uh, topography that is suitable to erode the forearc crust, the overriding continental crust. And this erosion here, this tectonic uh, sawing off material, this tectonic grinding off of material, that 
will contribute to the removal of material here from before us. This is crustal material, therefore it has a low density and is not very likely to be subducted at great depth. And it gets transferred to the bottom of the forearc crust and therefore uh, contribute to crustal thickening in such Andean type uh, situations. Also, it is unlikely that an accretionary prism would form as it is shown here in this uh, situation because tectonic erosion will remove material specifically soft material that might sit in such a position. The uh, most commonly cited example for uh, tectonic erosion are the central Andean margins of northern Chile and Peru. And here we see uh, a Google Earth image of that region, indicating the opposite movement vectors of the South American plate and the Nazca plate that we see here that both migrate at uh, pretty much the same uh, speed of 3.7, 3.6 centimeters a year. And here in these two regions, uh, we observe uh, quite substantial tectonic erosion. What we see here is that since the Jurassic, about 150 to 200 kilometers of continental crust have been tectonically removed. We know that because here in the coastal regions, we find the Jurassic arc plutonic rocks. The fossil Jurassic magmatic arc is now exposed right at the coastline here, and it should normally be something like 150 to 200 kilometers inland. That is where normally a magmatic arc should develop. So here, a very strong tectonic erosion has taken place in the last about 150, 200 million years. Here we see the thermal structure of subduction zone. We see here in contour lines the temperature isotherms, and uh, we start here with uh, 400 degrees, that means Grecia's facies uh, temperatures, and we go down here into uh, uh, very high temperature ranges uh, of uh, mantle conditions, 1200 degrees, 1000 degrees. And uh, we can see here due to the transport of material, we drag down the isotherms in uh, fairly deep uh, crustal levels. We see here in 800 kilometers, for instance, we still have a region in the downgoing slab that is only 1,200 degrees hot. Normally, at this depth, it should be significantly hotter than 1,600 degrees. We see here the uh, uh, thermally relaxed isotherms. They are horizontal. Uh, the bending comes simply from the dynamic down, um, downwards movement uh, of the downgoing lithosphere. Dehydration of oceanic crust, as you know, uh, takes place in about 100 to 200 kilometers uh, most uh, dominantly. And uh, uh, most of the magma on top of a downgoing slab is formed in the asthenospheric mantle uh, on top of the lithosphere, the downgoing lithosphere, in about 100 kilometers, actually not in 200, as it is shown here. Here, at this re in this region, the arc volcanic material is generated and it rises and might differentiate, might get contaminated by crustal material. But uh, initially, these are mantle mi magmas that uh, rise into the continental overriding lithosphere. Uh, we now will talk about a process that is called the rollback of the subductive slab. And we have uh, mentioned that at first year level. Comparing this process with the uh, retracting movement of a floating line to which uh, an anchor is attached, if you would uh, do that, you have a floating line, uh, and you throw an, an anchor uh, a bit away from such a boat, it would start sinking. Because it is sinking, it will be dragging itself in closer and closer to the boat. And uh, this uh, floating line would uh, somewhere curve at the position where the anchor just happens to be and would uh, continuously uh, move back towards the boat until it is vertical, provided that the water is uh, deep enough and the, water, and the anchor is still suspended in the water column. So what we have been talking about is uh, the fact that we, although we have oceanic lithosphere that is more dense than the uh, underlying asthenospheric mantle, uh, we, we know that a flat-lying oceanic plate does not subduct easily. But once it is bent downwards, the leading edge of the oceanic lithosphere uh, 
will uh, sink downward like an anchor rope. We see here these arrows here, they contribute to the uh, bending of the lithosphere and to the uh, backwards movement of this hinge zone. Uh, we see here these two stages compared to each other. This is also associated with the slab pull force. The slab pull force also forces the oceanic lithosphere downwards and gravity exerts a uh, vertical component and the ridge push will exert a horizontal component. And that means uh, these two components together will uh, control a kind of an oblique um, subduction angle. The higher the density of the subducting lithosphere, the stronger will be the vertical component. If we have a low density crust, then the horizontal movement component will be stronger and we will end up with a shallower subduction angle. In the effect, rollback will move the trench further and further to the right-hand side towards the ocean and away from the arc, but of course the arc crust has to follow suit and will close this gap eventually. Here we see again the rollback of a subducting slab. We see uh, at time 1 the downgoing slab, the downgoing lithosphere in uh, this position here. On top of it we find the trench also at the same time in this position. And with progressing rollback we will see that the trench moves further seaward and of course also the overriding uh, continental crust and lithosphere and the uh, creationary prism that we, that we see here will close that gap and uh, move seaward into a new position further to the left in our example. Of course again as we have seen the upper plate has to move to the left hand side in our example in order to close the gap between the upper plate and the rolling back down going lithosphere. Here and in the uh, next uh, two slides that we are going to see we will see what rollback actually controls and what kind of scenarios we can uh, expect to find along converging lithospheric plate margins. In this case here we see the overriding plate moves in the same direction as the rollback. We see here a vector for the overriding plate, that its direction, and that is the magnitude of its speed. And here we see the rollback, and you see also this vector is pointing in this direction. But we see that the vector of the rollback is shorter, that means the rollback is slower than the overriding plate continental plate moves in the same direction. This is what we see in the Andes. In the central Andes, South America is moving faster to the, to the west than the rollback can retreat the trench. That leads to a contraction in the overriding plate and that means that we have here the formation of a fall and thrust belt and we have a very substantial thickening of the Andean crust. That is why we have in the Andes a up to 70 kilometers thick continental crust and we have the formation of the high Andean plateaus. So what is important here to consider is the uh, relative orientation and the magnitude of the movement of the overriding plate and of the rollback. Here now the situation is different. Here the overriding plate also moves in the same direction as the roll back, but it is slower. Or it might even move in the opposite direction. Look at these two vectors. They are small either in this or in that direction, and compared to the roll back, we see that they are anyway smaller than the roll back movement. Now, obviously, we have to fill the gap, and uh, therefore we can uh, not have uh, and therefore, we will initiate extensional tectonics in the back arc, in this region here. This is what is uh, supposed to happen in the Mariana setting. Uh, an island arc has developed, and we have back arc spreading with the formation of a marginal sea. I don't believe that the Mar Marianas are a, are a specifically good example, but you will find them uh, cited uh, very commonly in, uh, in the literature. Important is that the island arc always has to remain on top of the subducting slab and therefore the whole island arc will actually follow suit with the rollback and also move to the left hand side 
contributing to further extension in the back arc. The same situation you would have if the overriding lithosphere is a continental one, then you also would extend the back arc crust, and this would then be a situation as we have seen it in uh, Japan, between Japan and the Asian mainland in the not too distant past. So here we are seeing now an example that uh, describes the situation that we find uh, in the Japanese islands. In the Japanese islands, we have a fragment of continental crust that got rifted off Asian mainland and is now separated by a uh, oceanic basin, by a small oceanic basin. Uh, so this used to be a back arc basin. Uh, at the moment, we do not see uh, significant or any extensional tectonics in this region. And that means the back arc currently is stable. That means that the overriding plate, the roll back, and the island arc movement that we see here, or the Japanese island, that all of them are moving in the same direction with the same magnitude of speed. However, the presence of a extensional back arc basin and oceanic lithosphere separating the Japanese islands from Asia means that in the geological history, there must have been an episode of back arc extension. And that means that at a certain stage in the past, the movement vectors must have been opposite comparing the uh, overriding plate and the rollback. This would create an extensional back arc basin that currently is not further extending. We currently have this stable position that shows neither extension nor contraction. However, we have been talking now a lot about these movement vectors and the roll back. This is a descriptive analysis. This does not uh, tell us what actually causes these variations. And uh, we have talked about the uh, initial reasons, uh, the driving forces. The driving force, whether we will have a fast roll back or a slow roll back, whether we will have back arc extension or not, is essentially the subduction angle. This controls the back arc evolution because it controls the velocity of the rollback. A steep subduction angle will result in usually a quite substantial rollback. A shallow subduction will have a slow rollback velocity. And here in these series of sketches, we can see again the different scenarios that result from different subduction angles. Unfortunately, in uh, Van der Plumen Marschak's textbook, these different subduction angles are not properly illustrated within each of these sketches. Here in this first sketch, and we just go back, we should actually have a shallower subduction angle than we see it here in the islet arc or in the Japanese situation. Let's now go a little bit more over some case studies and uh, we are starting here with the East Asian configuration with the Pacific plate being subducted underneath um, continental and oceanic lithosphere of, a of the Eastern Asian region. And uh, specifically, we want to talk here about the Marianas plate and the Philippine plate. We see here three plates are close to each other. The Philippine plate is practically entirely a oceanic plate, and so is the Marianas plate. That also applies essentially to the Pacific plate, which has virtually no continental component. So these three oceanic plates here are closely related to each other, specifically the origin of the Philippine, Philippine plate and the Marianas plate is related to the steep subduction of the Pacific plate. The Pacific plate in this situation, in this region here, is old, is cold, is a high density, and it will always go down. We have see here the indication down, down. The Pacific plate goes underneath the Japanese islands and underneath the Marianas Island arc that we see here as a light blue line. Right behind the Mariana Island arc, we see here a new mid-oceanic ridge. The, the situation is actually a little bit more complicated than we see here. But uh, we see here back arc spreading with the generation of new oceanic uh, lithosphere. And uh, we see that uh, this uh, oceanic lithosphere is overriding the Pacific plate, but it is uh, also undergoing further spreading. Uh, 
and the Philippine plate that we see here resulting as a counterpart to the Marianas plate on the other side of the mid-oceanic ridge is being subducted underneath the southern Japanese islands and here the Philippines. All this is shown here again uh, in a schematic sketch. Right, we see here the Marianas arc and the mid-oceanic ridge forming uh, the Philippine plate and the Marianas plate right behind it. And we see here in blue the subduction zone where the Pacific plate is going underneath this, uh, these two plates, Philippine and Marianas plate, whereas the Philippines plate is being subducted under southern Japan and the Philippines themselves. There are transform boundaries also involved that uh, make life a little bit more complicated. And you see here in the uh, region just south to this, uh, there is quite a nightmarish, uh, very complicated situation of subduction zones, transform faults, and uh, collision zones. In the uh, next slide, we are going to look at this region here with the Pacific plate over here. The, uh, Japanese islands in the north and the Philippine plate uh, in the south center. This is what we are seeing here. And we see here a lot of uh, local names and uh, the uh, Japanese islands with Kyushu, Shikoku, and Honshu in the north, Hokkaido even further north, the Kuril Trench and the Japan Trench, uh, the Izubonin uh, Marianas Trench, and the uh, Marianas Arc, Izubonin Marianas Arc is a complete name of it. Uh, that's what we see here. A number of uh, transform faults are uh, contributing to the structural inventory of this area. Here's the Sea of Japan. This is the area where we, uh, in the recent past, had some back arc oceanic crust forming. So here we see the situation on our schematic uh, structural map of the region. And uh, let's have a look at these two profiles of the subduction zones in the north here, the northern Izubonin arc in this position, and the northern Mariana arc here in the south. We can see here from the monitoring of the Benioff zone earthquakes, uh, the subduction angle of the Pacific plate is very different in these two parts. And uh, this has its, its reason. Uh, more shallow subduction here, uh, seemingly shallow, is still fairly steep and it is typical for Pacific plate, for high density Pacific plate being subducted underneath uh, the continental margin here of the uh, continental sliver of Japan or underneath the Philippine Sea Plate. The subduction angle that we see here in the Northern Marianas Arc is uh, practically vertical. You see here, after a relatively short bending from a depth of about 100 to 200 kilometers, the subduction angle is, is vertical. And this has its reasons. For the moment, let's uh, eliminate a few typos here. We see positions of trench and volcanic arc. And obviously, uh, this is wrong. Uh, the uh, trench would be somewhere here in both uh, in both segments of the subduction zones and the volcanic arcs. Uh, the island arc uh, is uh, somewhat behind. And uh, here let's have a look at a uh, illustration of the situation here in the Marianas arc region. You see here the uh, magmatic arc, and we see here a uh, actually another magmatic arc. Here we see the Marianas trench and the subduction of the Pacific plate that uh, becomes almost vertical. And here we see the subduction of the Marianas plate lithosphere. So it is a bilateral subduction with the formation of a double volcanic arc in this region. And uh, this is the reason why I think the Marianas situation is not a very good example for back arc spreading. Because in the standard type of back arc spreading, we would not have this bilateral subduction of oceanic lithosphere. And this steep bilateral subduction forces the subduction angle to be near vertical because uh, these two subducting plates come into conflict with each other. When we are talking about East Asia and the uh, Japanese uh, subduction zones, we, of course, should mention the uh, large-scale earthquakes that quite regularly happen there, such as the uh, large earthquake on 11th March of 2011, which uh, is an 
according to other sources, a 9.0 magnitude, one of the largest earthquakes ever recorded. Here we have the subduction of the Pacific Plate at relatively high angle underneath the uh, uh, Honshu crust. And uh, here in this fore arc, uh, the earthquake occurred. It occurred uh, in a situation where reverse faulting was involved. And this reverse faulting uh, was associated, uh, was preceded by a number of smaller earthquakes, which later could be interpreted as uh, foreshocks. And uh, the number of earthquakes shown here only are summarizing some of the more serious ones in the region related to the uh, March event in 2000, 2011. If you would plot all of the earthquakes that could be uh, measured and analyzed uh, in this uh, time and related to this mega event, uh, there would be virtually hundreds and thousands of smaller seismic events. There was also a uh, significant earthquake in the uh, downgoing slab in the Pacific crust in about 26 kilometers depth, depth still a 7.1 magnitude event, a very, very substantial earthquake, uh, but uh, still almost uh, 100 times less intense than the uh, main event of the uh, Sendai Honshu earthquake on March 11th. I show only a few of the uh, images that were taken uh, at that day. Uh, you know that uh, the Japanese islands uh, obviously have a very, very good infrastructure for reporting such mega events. Lots of helicopters were in the air at the time when the related tsunami hit the Honshu coast. And here you see, uh, I think this was one of the best documented uh, tsunamis ever uh, because it uh, it uh, happened during the day, and it happened at a time and a place where uh, lots of camera teams were uh, available. And uh, when you go to the internet and you type in into Google a few search terms like Honshu and tsunami, you will find a lot of videos that document very impressively how tsunamis hit coastlines. This was uh, essentially what I wanted to say about uh, the convergent lithospheric margins. Uh, we are carrying on in the next section with uh, continent-continent collision. Thank you very much.